My name is Grant Souter and I'm a doctoral student in the Teaching and Learning Program at Illinois State University. I am also a facilitator of music at the ISU Lab Schools. So thank you for checking out this video of my literature review on autonomy supportive strategies for music educators in performing middle school and high school performing ensembles. Uh, oh, just one, one second, I'm so sorry, I just got a message here. Hi, it's me. Me who? Me, as in you. So you are me. Yes, from the past. Me from the past? That's right. I'm hoping to know what you know now, then, which is now for me, the you from the past. Okay, so what do you want to know? I want to know how to better support student musical independence. Obviously. All right, I get it, I get it. So how can music educators in middle and high school performing ensembles foster greater musical independence? Great question, and uh, lucky you, I just finished my literature review on that very topic. To guide my research, I used the following question. What autonomy supportive instructional strategies have been successful in increasing musical independence in middle and high school performing ensembles? Wait. What exactly do you mean by autonomy and autonomy supportive? That's a good question. For teachers, autonomy might conjure up images of a free-for-all or a very permissive classroom environment. But according to self-determination theory, autonomy, along with relatedness and competence, is a critical piece of psychological well-being and optimal functioning. It's having a sense of self derived through agency, choice, and the belief that one has ownership of their behavior. Autonomy supportive is just kind of a fancy way to mean teaching in a manner that fosters independence in students. So what strategies did music teachers employ to increase student musical independence? Okay, so I see you want me to get to the point. I got it. So beyond the most traditional teacher-centered approaches, three categories kind of emerged from least autonomous to most autonomous. I kind of gave the following identifiers. The listener, the coach, the visionary. The listener? Aren't all musicians good listeners? Well, being a musician might mean you're able to listen to the ensemble musically, but that doesn't mean educators are necessarily open to the ideas that their students might have. So the listener maintains a fairly traditional ensemble that's largely teacher-centered and focused on skills and performance. However, they might allow for some student input. For some strategies to include student input might be to let them have some choice in repertoire, student jobs, and some musical decisions regarding the performance. They might also include small group work, but it did seem that there were limits to these peer interactions actions by the educator selecting the groups based on skill and ability level rather than allowing students to choose their own groups and music. The listener sounds like they might be a nice director to play under, but what's the difference between the listener and the other categories? Good question, and I'm glad you used the word director. Although the previous strategies were used by most autonomy supportive instructors, the listener's methods of centering the students pretty much stopped there. As strategies move from low autonomy support, the listener, to higher autonomy support, the coach or the visionary, Widener suggests that leaders of ensembles reframe their role from director as conductor, the person who serves as the primary decision maker, to director as educator. Director as educator reinforces student growth with elements found in non-music class, such as differentiation, scaffolding, explicit instruction, mini lessons and application or practice time, critical thinking and decision making. Grimada suggests a third option for reframing their role. This is the director as facilitator. Rooted in constructivist practices and leveraging the power of social interaction in learning, a facilitator guides students to build their own understandings. Okay, I'm starting to get it. So what's the next category? Right. The second category is the coach. The coach also leads a largely traditional ensemble, but by adopting the identity of director as educator and centering students in instructional decisions, the coach targets learning goals that can be transferred to other musical settings and also supports the development of broader transferable skills. Shai and also refer to this approach as independence within. Students gain independence from participating within the rules and structures of a specific tradition, such as band, orchestra, or choir. Within? So does independence within mean learning to figure out how to practice and improve their parts? So that's part of it. In fact, there was a large focus in the literature on students' effectiveness with error detection and solution finding. This research showed that students were limited in strategies and that they could identify error in peer performances, but often struggled to offer solutions. Sure, there were a bunch of strategies found in the coach category in the literature. Widener suggests cognitive apprenticeship as a useful framework for thinking about um, the coach shifting from conductor as director to conductor as educator, and perhaps even moving towards conductor as facilitator. The strategy of cognitive apprenticeship moves through the three distinct phases of modeling, coaching, and fading. The first phase is modeling, and two forms of modeling occurred in this phase. The first was teacher modeling, and the second was peer modeling. So the teacher might provide clear demonstrations and application of the process of musical decision 
decision making. In peer modeling, teachers might employ peer demonstrations in both the large and small group setting. Peer modeling was shown to have a positive impact on student understanding, psychological well-being, and an increase in competence, relatedness, and autonomy. The second phase of cognitive apprenticeship is coaching. In this phase, the teacher steps aside and allows the students to engage in critical thinking and decision making that had been previously modeled by the teacher. Examples of this strategy might be chamber music groups, student-run rehearsals, informal learning, technology implementation, and meaningful and authentic assessments early on so that students can know where they are in their learning and know what to do to improve. This type of learning is messy and not always linear. Examples of environmental strategies might be de-emphasizing concerts and instead focusing on the experiences leading up up to the concert, providing opportunities for social connections and rapport building, and developing the skills necessary for music making, preparation, working with others, and the importance of individual contributions to the larger group. Examples of teacher-moderated instruction would be allowing students time to solve musical problems on their own, using vague questioning to encourage critical thinking, opportunities for musical decision making, and shifting the focus away from talent and instead providing feedback related to persistence and effort. Wow, great stuff to think about there. But you said there was a third phase to cognitive apprenticeship? That's right. The third and perhaps most difficult of the phases is fading. Fading positions the teacher as an observer and a resource for students. And examples of fading might be students running chamber music groups, students planning, organizing, and running sectionals, students composing and conducting their own pieces without teacher intervention. In this phase, students are responsible for problem solving, decision making, and managing peer interactions with minimal support. So cool. This is exactly the type of thing I hope to get better at. I love seeing students have those aha moments. Sometimes I think I get in the way before those moments can happen. Exactly. I think this is something many music teachers dream about, but it can be really scary, especially when there aren't a whole lot of examples of this style of teaching out there. Exactly. But wait, you said there was a third category? The visionary? What could be more autonomy supportive than the fading phase of the coach? The main difference is how the learning space is used and how the educator views their role in the space. The visionary seeks to create a model of musical independence that imagines new ways to structure student-centered experiences and facilitates learning experience that often blur aesthetic lines of genre and culture as well as time and space through digital sonic spaces. They might do this, for example, by incorporating non-traditional elements into their classrooms such as technology and informal and popular music styles. Say more. Remember, we're not that smart. Okay, well remember the earlier concept of teaching independence from within? Uh-huh. Well, Shai and Asa recommend extending that framework to independence with, through, and beyond. Teachers guide students to first understand the traditions, norms, and codes, that's learning within, then apply that knowledge in a manner of their own imagination, that's learning with, through, and beyond. So what are some specific strategies? It all seems so abstract. Yeah, I think this is a big part of the visionary. It requires being able to think about schooling in a different way, and especially in the context of an ensemble. But some possible examples might be using problem-based learning, approximating musical communities found outside of school in the school music setting, Exploring and encouraging students to blend multiple modalities and mediums, responding to social issues, or the wildly imaginative idea of the collective. This is when the music classroom becomes a flexible space where multiple self-directed projects are happening at the same time, and often mixing things like performance and digital and print work and recording and video, um, where students collaborate in a number of ways that use elements of traditional or mixed music ensembles. Examples such as preparing for a Battle of the Bands concert, student compositions for short films or podcasts, podcasts, and recording or producing a song or album. So cool. It would be great to see more examples of this type of ensemble approach. I want to get started exploring some of these ideas. And you need to wrap this up soon. Are there any other things I should consider or more research needed? Fair point. Educators have to be careful not to produce environments where unclear expectations and norms may cause harm to students' relationships or fracture of trust within the ensemble. Music educators also need to consider the structural and institutional factors that may impede independence. Classrooms exist within larger school environments, and those exist, again, within larger cultural environments, and often ignore the more structural and cultural influences of power. Also, traditional music programs can play a role in social reproduction. These things can limit who might choose to enroll in classes and thus miss out on the diversity of skill and culture and perspective and may completely ignore that students are engaged in musical practices outside of school. Another related area of consideration would be culturally relevant practices. Are you done yet? Yes, I'm done. Well, me from the past, it was great talking to you and good luck and keep me posted on how it goes. All right. Don't forget your reference slides. Okay, thanks for the reminder. Here they are.